I'm going to talk about mental health during the pandemic, uh, particularly on the contrast between public health measures and um, people's lived realities, um, pointing out to a gap in this sense. Uh, I've included here in the first slide my email address as well. So if you have any further follow-up questions after the Q&A, um, feel free to send them by email. In terms of the outline, I'll first look a little bit at the initial COVID-19 response and the question of mental health. And after that, um, I'm also going to look at some studies, um, so empirical studies on mental health that were done yeah, between 2020 and 2021. Um, and then as a comment as a, and an analysis um, of these studies, I'm going to um, zoom in on, on this issue of there being a gap between policy and local context. And I'm going to draw some correspondences between um, policies in response to COVID-19 and uh, mental health policy on a global level. And then, yeah, I have some conclusions most of them are more like open questions. So I'd be happy to discuss about those in the Q&A. Um, early on um, the pandemic, there has been a, a mental health warning from WHO accompanied by some guidelines. I'm not going to go through these in detail. So you have some excerpts here. Um, I'll just mention some of them. Uh, people were advised not to look too much um, uh, at news about COVID-19 and especially yeah, in March last year, it was particularly difficult to do so as most uh, news venues uh, would only um, report on COVID-19. Being supportive of others, but then there were the limitations of lockdowns and such. So uh, technological means were encouraged like telephone, social media, video conference and so on. Um, and yeah, so amplifying positive or um, hopeful stories. Um, so this is, yeah, in terms of the guidelines, in terms of research on this topic, there's a, a 2020 article that calls for research on mental health. And there are two dimensions here um, that amount to the, the main questions here. One of them uh, concerns uh, what kind of effects the pandemic would have in terms of people experiencing anxiety, depression, and um, other mental health problems. Um, whereas a second question was, um, how would measures such as social or physical distancing affect mental health? So we have two dimensions here that I'm going to elaborate a bit more on. Um, this is a news article from the BBC that was yeah, already in May 2020, um, a warning from psychiatrists about a uh, tsunami of um, mental illness. Again, uh, what we have here is an expected uh, deterioration of mental health. Um, and again, there is distress that can be due to the pandemic and here anxiety would be a, a big issue. Uh, but then there's also distress caused by the public health measures, particularly loneliness, social isolation, their consequences on mental health, but on physical health as well. Again, in terms of suggestions at this point, mostly, so yeah, communication technology, counseling, and yeah, when this is not available in person, then um, also by uh, technological means. Um, now this is uh, on the left here, um, you have a screenshot from The Guardian. This is an article that was published uh, in early 2021, um, following some uh, longitudinal studies. These were done in the, in the context of the UK. And um, in this article, we, we have this metaphor of the tsunami of mental health problems being questioned. Um, so what the trend is, is that uh, the symptoms of uh, several Mental health problems have increased uh, in the beginning of the pandemic as the first uh, lockdowns were being instated, and then they started to decrease. Um, so this is a pattern that shows resilience. Um, now, in terms of the size of the population experiencing these problems, um, this has been uh, shown to be about a quarter of the population, um, and it overlaps with people uh, with various vulnerabilities. The most notable ones I have included there, that is a history of mental illness, experiencing loneliness, um, experiencing anxiety over uncertainty or over death, and people who have little control um, over their circumstances. 
Um, now, Ben told in this article is saying that, yes, this is a quarter of the population, but it's not a tsunami. So there's also um, a critique of using this kind of rhetoric, which might uh, backfire in terms of generating more um, anxiety. Now, another interesting finding of this series of studies was that people reported uh, feeling anxiety mostly in connection with their economic circumstances. There were some people who reported high levels of anxiety uh, because of being somehow exposed to the virus or being in contact with people who have been um, diagnosed, uh, but the, this correlation was relatively weak. So um, the levels of anxiety correlated more with um, economic um, issues. Um, to include um, data outside of the uh, global north, there's a, a recent cross-sectional study in Bangladesh. There are some limitations here. Notably, this is not a longitudinal study, so uh, you cannot track resilience, for instance. Um, and this was realized um, online, so uh, it's not representative of all segments of the um, population. Um, now, in terms of the factors that were associated with poor mental health, according to the study, um, are being a woman, being unemployed, being a student, suffering from obesity, um, or living without a family. In terms of recommendations that the authors are not necessarily making, but um, they're reviewing them in relation to other studies, are included psychotropic medication, staying off news sources or social media, relaxation techniques, counseling, social support, although it's not mentioned what kind of social support, and then mental health training to specific professionals, which is a, a broader um, public health um, strategy. Um, now, if we wrap up in terms of the, the findings of such studies, uh, we see that there are socioeconomic aspects that have an impact on uh, mental health, and these hold, yeah, across the, the global north, global south uh, distinction. So economic hardship being a, an important one, uh, people not being able to exercise control over their circumstances, the experience of loneliness and isolation. Then there's some culturally specific aspects as well. Gender is one in the example that I've used. The importance of family, um, again, is um, uh, another one. I should point out that there are also intersections between the two. So in societies where there's less gender equality, then being a woman does also correlate with having um, uh, less control over one's circumstances. So um, that's one possible pathway to uh, experiencing mental health problems. Um, now I've included a, a quotation here from an article by Burgess that's criticizing um, the, the guidelines from WHO that I've shared um, earlier in the presentation. I'm not going to read all of it, just the um, first example. Um, so once again, recommendations for get half the equation or need to address the social and economic roots to poor mental health. Uh, a woman has lost her job and cannot feed her family will find no relief from a meditation app. Um, so the question is, yes, you can stay off the news, you can use meditation, maybe you can get some um, medical assistance, but that's not going to address the, the social and economic problems that uh, people um, had to struggle with um, throughout the uh, lockdown. Um, so looking at this, there's some questions um, that I'm not necessarily going to attempt to, to ask to answer right now, although I'll, I'll focus mostly on, on the last one. Um, so here's the first question, was the impact of social and economic factors on mental health predictable in the context of the pandemic? Uh, so we have those studies right now, but given what we know about um, mental illness, how much of this was uh, predictable? And then in light of that, should the policies that um, were meant to prevent um, further infections with uh, COVID-19, should they have been framed differently, keeping these aspects in mind? Or perhaps if the policies um, were the same, should they have been supplemented with additional measures uh, such as to uh, diminish the impact on mental health? Um, and then finally, how should the, the findings above um, inform uh, future public health policy? Um, so when you have this intersection between mental health and um, a public health uh, emergency. Um, now one thing that I, I'd like to point out um, right now is, 
that this seems to be a, a broader issue um, about the COVID-19 response um, and the neglect of local context and uh, people's experiences. Um, there are two studies that I'm referencing here. Um, I'll read the yeah, only part of the, the quotations here. So uh, broadband and smart, all that, the advice is the same globally, but the context is not the same. They explored this in relation to the case of South Africa. Then um, Adinti et al. Um, mention again that the case of lockdowns and social distancing and the issue of informal spaces. Um, so I'll read the highlighted part, the reductionist model that continues to shape the COVID-19 response mechanism in urban spaces of the global south tends to neglect the pre-existing inequalities, groups and actors that define the urban informality. Um, and this article focuses on the case of Kenya. Um, so particularly when we look at the contrast between Global North and Global South cases, we see that these policies are not adjusted um, according to the, the local context and experiences. Now, why is this so? Um, I'm only trying to answer this partially here. Um, I think that epistemic practices play an important role here. Um, and this has been pointed out in uh, different forms. Um, one issue is the um, lack or the insufficient use of epistemic pluralism. And I think, yeah, I hope this is going to go nicely with the, the next talk. Um, there are basically are two kind of objections uh, that were brought regarding this um, with regard to the um, COVID-19 response, namely that the action has been driven mostly by the number of COVID cases and deaths and economic effects, as well as pre-existing inequities have been overlooked and then over reliance on epidemiological models for policy. Um, then another issue is that trade-offs of policy responses such as lockdowns or social distancing have been overlooked. Um, I've looked at the case of loneliness and its effects on uh, mental health, but not only that, um, in a paper. Then in relation to the, to, to the talks earlier in this conference, I also think that uh, the search for a master model that will, would lead to the oversimplification of some aspects is also part of the um, uh, problem. Um, and in terms of the consequences of this, we have consequences within countries as well. So um, the most vulnerable are going to be more severely affected um, by the yeah, social and um, economic uh, consequences of this. Uh, but then also in terms of the global north-south relations, um, as yeah, local information is not taken into consideration, as the policies are framed according to global north context, then um, the effect is going to be exacerbated. Um, so now I'm going to um, draw a, a parallel to um, issues in mental health policy and critiques that have been raised. Um, Critiques of global approaches to, to mental health have been discussed, particularly in the domain of um, cultural psychiatry, anthropology as well. Um, I believe there are uh, interesting philosophical aspects to this that unfortunately are underexplored at the moment. But yeah, I think this is an area that um, can be further uh, investigated. Um, two things that uh, I'd like to mention here with examples as well. So the critique of the global health uh, mental health movement raises issues such as the medicalization of social and economic issues that often in global South context originate uh, in other kind of factors, um, for instance, colonialism and so on. Then over-reliance on a biomedical model of um, mental disorder, uh, the marginalization of local approaches and understandings of illness. Um, and then in relation to the DSM-5, um, while the notion of a culture bound syndrome was dropped. Um, uh, what philosophers of psychiatry have argued is that still uh, we have a, a view on mental illness that is modeled on the Western individual. And then we consider um, mental illness as experienced outside of the, uh, let's say European or North American context as being a, a kind of deviation from that. Just to give you an example, depression is associated with low mood. So that's a, a typical symptom of depression. Um, but then uh, again, if you look at, uh, at the context of uh, East Asia, for instance, lower back pain would be the most common symptom. Um, so if you define depression um, 
by reference to Western um, individual, then you're going to overlook lower back pain as a, a possible symptom. Um, so just to, to show the correspondence between these, I, I put this in a, a table here. So on the one hand, in the COVID-19 response, uh, we see a neglect of evidence um, with relation to social or economic aspects of public health and further consequences um, for, yeah, for other health related issues. In the context of global mental health policy, there's a neglect of socioeconomic conditions that are conducive to mental illness. In the COVID-19 response, uh, we see a dominance of epidemiological models, whereas um, in the uh, global mental health policy, we see a dominance of the biomedical model of mental illness. Um, in COVID-19 response, we have the search for a one-size-fits-all model, uh, while in the global mental health policy, we have a neglect of local approaches and understandings of illness and the context in which uh, mental illness arises. So I think uh, these are fairly um, similar. Um, now, some um, preliminary conclusion. Um, there's a history of, of neglect, of social and economic aspects of health and illness, and uh, this typically has effects on the, the people who are more vulnerable. Now, this effect is exacerbated in the uh, Global South context, where local or culturally specific aspects are left out. So this can be framed as an epistemic shortcoming that has practical consequences, and yeah, in particular with regards to the ethics of um, applying uh, certain policies in this uh, context. Um, this emphasizes a need to include um, the improvement of socioeconomic conditions in global health policy, just to use the, the case of mental health. Um, if you recommend, for instance, psychiatric medication that might help an individual feel better, um, but maybe this should be backed up with policies to su support the unemployed, because yeah, even if the individual recovers, if they still have to struggle with unemployment, uh, they're not likely to um, do well. Um, likely, there's a need to incorporate local social, cultural, and economic factors in global health research, particularly to fill this um, epistemic gap. Um, and yeah, in terms of further questions, we have a, a dilemma here, how to make the, the current approaches more flexible, such as to en encompass a variety of local conditions, or perhaps should we give up these ambitions of having one approach and there should only be multiple local responses? Um, I don't really have an answer to this, so I I'll be happy to discuss about that. Uh, what I would like to point out is that this is already a question in um, cross-cultural psychiatry, so whether mental illness is a universal kind of concept or wh whether we have multiple mental um, disorders experienced um, according to culture, local context, and so on. So I believe the, that the COVID-19 case shows a, a need to expand this question to the broader um, context of uh, public health policy. Um, this is it. Thank you for your attention. Um, these are the references, if anyone is interested.